In September of 2010, the area I'm standing in right now was the scene of a raging inferno. This was the Four Mile Fire in Boulder County, Colorado, and it turned into what was at the time the most destructive fire in the state's history. It burned 169 homes and caused more than $200 million in damage. So why am I standing here on a burned out landscape in a course about water in the Western United States? Well, it's because what happens here in our forested watersheds can have really significant impacts on our water supplies downstream. So in this lecture, what I'm gonna to try to cover is how what happens to these islands of moisture where we get so much of our water supply in the West can have really significant impacts downstream. And I'm gonna cover three major topics. I'm gonna to cover wildfires, infestations of bark beetles, and the deposition of desert dust on snowpack. So let's start off with wildfire. Again, we're standing here in the scene of what was an incredibly destructive and high severity fire. How does what happens after a wildfire affect what happens to the landscape in a way that shapes our water supplies downstream? Well, first look around, see what we see here. This was a forested hillside. Now we see blackened stumps of trees. We see some grass. We don't see a whole lot of vegetation. We see a very different character. So what we've had is we've had removal of much of the vegetation that used to be here. What's pretty much remaining alive here at this point is just some grass. So at a minimum, we can think of the fact that all of these trees and other plants that were here sucking up moisture out of the soil and transpiring it out of their leaves are no longer doing that. In addition, by removing much of the vegetation, we're removing a lot of what was there to anchor the soil in place. So trees and plants with their roots keep soil stable, and that's a really important function. Without them here, that can really do a lot to change the character of these, la of these landscapes and these watersheds. What also can happen is we will lose our entire organic layer. So if you think about a profile of soil as you go from the surface down, your first layer is organic. So that's plant matter, it can be tree leaves, it can be grasses, etc. Things that decompose and turn into an organic layer of soil. When the fire gets hot enough, that entire organic layer can be removed. Underneath you, you're left with mineral soil, basically broken down rock. And that mineral soil is much more erodible than the organic soil. And there's nothing to keep it in place. So that's another really significant impact. And then what can actually happen on top of that mineral soil is that the effect of the heating of the fire can actually seal the soil. That means that the soil no longer allows water to infiltrate and percolate down through the soil layers. Instead, the water rolls perfectly downstream very quickly. All of this can have really significant impacts, especially when you get a rainstorm shortly after a fire burns through. So your fire burns through, rain hits the landscape, and all that water can run off really quickly. So one of the first effects that we worry about after a fire is actually flooding. A rainstorm that otherwise might not have caused too much damage can have much more significant impacts when it occurs on top of a burned area. We also are concerned about sedimentation. So you've got all this very erodible soil, and it gets pushed down by the rain, it runs off into our streams and rivers, and it can really change the quality and the sedimentation in those water bodies. So if you take a look at this video, you'll see people who are kayaking on the Poudre River that's in northern Colorado outside of Fort Collins. And this is in 2012, shortly after the High Park Fire. The High Park Fire burned a significant portion of the landscape around this river, and all of the ash got pushed down by rainfall and created what is essentially a black river. That's just a visual example of the kind of impacts you can have. And these impacts don't go away after a few years. In some cases, you get these very high severity fires that can really change the landscape for a long time to come. This is a really important effect that's on the minds of many water managers because what can happen here can have really important effects on the quality and quantity. It can result in total changes in water chemistry as well as major increases in sedimentation in addition to creating short lasting but, but significantly higher flows. These uh, increases in water running off, the change in the quality of running water coming down can have impacts in communities around the burn area and communities downstream. And we know in the West where water resources are scarce and where our water resources connect so many of the people that live out here, this is very important. So let's move on to our second major impact in for forested watersheds, and that's the effect of remarkably tiny bugs called bark beetles. 
So bark beetles are a family of insects that all are characterized by the fact that they eat through the bark of trees and destroy the living tissue to kill trees. And they can go from uh, a certain phase where they only kill a few trees at a time to these massive epidemics where they'll kill millions and millions of acres. In the West, this is actually a natural process. This is most common actually in times of drought. So drought stresses trees, reduces their ability to produce sap, and, and basically erodes their defenses. They are less easily able to fight off these tiny beetles. So a drought like that actually started around the year 2000 in the American West, and that triggered a major epidemic of bark beetle infestations. An epidemic so big that in the state of Colorado alone, we've seen over 4 million acres of forest affected by these bark beetle infestations. So we saw lots and lots of trees dying, and that, as you would imagine, can have major impacts on watersheds. So imagine, if you will, a, a given watershed where we lose up to three quarters of the living trees. Naturally, you would think, well, there goes a lot of the transpiration. There goes a lot of the water sucked up from the soil and transpired out the leaves. And that naturally means more water left to, be inf to infiltrate through the ground and to end up in our streams and rivers. Of course, it's not nearly that simple. It's not like logging, which is actually uh, a fairly well understood phenomenon where if you cut down strips of a forest, you get a lot more water coming off of the snowmelt in that area because you don't have the trees there to suck up the water. But in a bark beetle infestation, you often don't get all of the trees dead. You in fact have uh, the remaining trees living are often the smallest, um, youngest trees that were sort of waiting for the old guys to get out of the way. And those old guys get out of the way and the young trees suddenly find themselves with more sunlight, more water, more nutrients, and they start growing up much more quickly. And that can start to mitigate some of the effects of the death of the older trees. You also have uh, additional mitigating factors. For example, as trees die from a bark beetle infestation, they'll lose their needles uh, and they will start allowing more snow to fall directly to the ground instead of being intercepted by the tree itself and sublimated back up into the atmosphere. On the other hand, that also means that more sunlight can come in as uh, the spring moves along and the snowmelt occurs, you get more sunlight hitting the snowpack itself, accelerating the snowmelt. So bark beetle infestations can result in this variety of different factors that uh, together have a rather nuanced effect on the landscape. And so in order to try to tease apart what this might mean, so are we really going to see more water out of these watersheds or not, scientists have used a variety of methods to investigate this question. And I'll simply uh, reference one recent study that came out which use computer models to say, okay, given that all these trees are dead and the landscape has changed in this fashion, what are we actually seeing in terms of how much water is coming out of a watershed? And those scientists found on the order of roughly 10% more water coming out of a watershed. Now, that's a, a fairly a significant number in the West where water resources are scarce, but we should also put it in the context of the variability of precipitation in the West. The variability from year to year, as we've already discussed, can be quite significant. And so 10% is much smaller than the level of variation that we get from year to year and how much snow we see. So it's an important effect, but it's not necessarily one that outweighs lots of other things like the pattern of weather that delivers precipitation to us in the winter. So this is still an active area of research, but something that's a very interesting and very recent phenomenon affecting our landscapes here in the West. The third phenomenon is interesting because it's something that really affects the water that comes out of our islands of moisture, our forested mountain, mountain watersheds, but it doesn't originate here. It actually originates elsewhere in the desert, in fact. Uh, and this is desert dust deposition on snowpack. So in the Colorado Plateau region, which is roughly around the four corners, as we call it, that, that are comprised of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah, uh, you have sandy soils that naturally are anchored down by cryptobiotic soil crust. These are living soil crusts that keep the soil in place and prevent it from being mobilized across the landscape. In the mid-1800s, settlers brought massive numbers of cattle to the region. And these cattle, simply by walking around, destroyed those soil crusts. And these soil crusts can take a very long time to grow back. So the cattle changed the landscape by destroying the soil crusts and allowing the soil to become mobilized much more easily. The numbers of cattle in this region are much lower now, but we're still doing things that can damage the soil crust, for example, building roads. So we have a lot of soil that's easily uh, able to be picked up by the wind and moved. Um, and in fact, that's what happens when the weather pattern sets up in the right direction and the winds are blowing uh, in the correct manner, desert dust will actually get picked up by the wind and moved and create these dramatic apocalyptic looking scenes across the Colorado Plateau and, and towns surrounding it, where you see middle of the day, you'll see 
dark orange or brown skies. Now that alone is significant, but what's, what's interesting for those of us who, who are learning about water is that this dust can move even further and get deposited on our high mountain watersheds where much of our snowpack resides and where much of our water supplies originate. So now we suddenly have these snowpacks changing and they're changing in an interesting way. Their color is changing. So we'll pause for a moment and introduce this term that's called albedo. Now albedo is reflectivity. It's a scientific word that simply means how much of the sun's incoming energy is reflected back up into the atmosphere. An albedo of one means roughly perfect reflectivity. That would be all of the sun's incoming energy being reflected back out into the atmosphere. Pure white snow has an albedo of nearly one. Pure white snow is very reflective. It reflects much of the sun's energy back out, which is actually why it can, be very, uh, can actually take a long time for pure white snow to melt. But now you introduce dust being deposited on the snow, and this dust is brown or orangish in color. And actually what happens as the snow begins to melt, you have different layers of dust from different storms that have deposited on the snowpack. And as the snow melts, these layers come together. That means actually that the snow starts getting darker and darker as the, as the dust accumulates. This darker and darker snow is absorbing more and more of the sun's energy. That's reducing the albedo, in fact, by up to about half. And that means that the snowpack now has so much more of the sun's energy in it, which of course is going to turn the snow into water. It's going to turn into liquid water. It's going to start to melt the snow. And this, this can actually uh, be a pretty dramatic change in the timing of snowmelt in this region. Uh, some computer modeling studies have shown that this can be up to one to two months earlier snowmelt uh, just by the phenomenon of dust deposition on snowpack in years when we get a lot of this dust deposition. That's a pretty big change in this region, which has major implications for things like reservoir storage or natural ecosystems. And then there's a secondary impact that occurs as the snowpack starts to melt faster and faster. And that's actually that you have a longer growing season. That means plants are taking more time over the course of the year, sucking up water and transpiring it out their leaves and changing it from water available as runoff into water that's now water vapor. So that actually can potentially mean less water in our watershed and in uh, river basins. So scientists have estimated that it's possible that we might be seeing up to 5% less stream flow in the Colorado River due simply to the phenomenon of de desert dust deposition on snowpack. 5% is of course pretty important in an, in an area where water resources are this scarce. But let's put it in context, 5% of the Colorado River Basin's flow is actually twice the allocation that Las Vegas gets from the Colorado River. So think about that. Two Las Vegas's worth of water are being lost because of this phenomenon of desert dust deposition on snowpack. So that was just a quick brief tour of three major impacts that can occur on our watersheds that have really major significant impacts on water, both quality-wise and quantity-wise, as it flows to our downstream cities and downstream farms. I hope that was interesting, and I hope you learned a little something out of it, and maybe appreciate why now water managers in this region don't just think about what happens in streams and rivers, they think about what happens across our landscapes. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.